the National Recovery Administration, to set prices and create a code of what it considered to be fair prices. Price controls aren't really supported by modern economists anymore. The reason is that when you install a price ceiling, it keeps prices artificially low. Okay, that's the point. Makes sense so far. But demand is decreased to the point where supply can't keep up. This is where you see empty grocery stores because people are buying things out and they're being sold for far below their value. And producers simply aren't as incentivized to make more of it because they might lose money in the transaction. One Roman writer noted that Diocletian, by various taxes, he had made all things exceedingly expensive, attempted by a law to limit their prices. The much blood of merchants was shed for trifles, men were afraid to offer anything for sale, and the scarcity became more excessive and grievous than ever. Until in the end, the price limit law, after having proved destructive to many people, was from mere necessity abolished. Another factor, too, in addition to having empty shelves in grocery stores and other places, goods still appear, but they don't appear in government-backed stores, they appear in black markets, where prices for those reflect what the goods are actually worth instead of those in the controlled market. Black markets flourished in wartime, in World War I, in World War II, and practically any war that you can look at. In the United States, when there were restrictions on food, gas, rubber, and metal— these goods were restricted in order to support the war effort and build military equipment, there was a thriving black market also in the United States. One of the main sources of black market goods were farmers. In Britain, farmers declared fewer domestic animal births to the Ministry of Food than actually happened so that they could sell this meat on the black market. Milton Friedman, a Nobel Prize winning economist, said, We economists don't know much, but we do know how to create a shortage. If you want to create a shortage of tomatoes, for example, just pass a law that retailers can't sell tomatoes for more than two cents a pound. Instantly, you'll have a tomato shortage, and it's the same with oil or gas. While Germany enacted price controls in the 1930s and 1940s with one goal in mind, and that was to win World War II. All goods essential to the war were acquired by the government at a reduced cost. And prices were controlled in order to limit inflation. But like any other places, resulted in a black market. Now, it wasn't just an upper limit on prices that was used in price controls. There were also price floors that were introduced for stocks or bonds. This prevented securities from declining in value so you wouldn't have the same type of death spiral like you saw in the 1920s. What this meant is that stock prices didn't reflect their actual value. So stock markets were frozen and trade dwindled until it was almost non-existent. But if it reflected the actual value, they would have lost heavily as the war effort turned against the Nazis, and they wouldn't able to keep their factories running. Factories may not have liked this, but in the Nazi period, they were run to support the war effort, not to make profits. Many countries had price floors, and they were introduced during World War I in England, in the United States, in Germany, and other countries. Stocks traded at full price, but market makers only had to put up a little bit of the cost of the stocks, waiting until settlement days to balance their accounts. If there were a steep decline in prices, it would have bankrupted many of the stock market's traders. So the price floors prevented panic selling. But trading in many securities stopped because no one was willing to buy shares for less than they were worth. So between January 1943 and June 1948, there was almost no change in the German stock market index, and almost nobody was training. It was a ghost town. After World War II, the economic situation for Germany got worse. The money supply continued to grow. It expanded fivefold between 1939 and 1945, but the prices of goods were fixed. Ration coupons were given out for some goods, but the amount of rations couldn't meet daily needs for people, and consumers had to turn to the black market. By the time Germany was under military occupation at the end of World War II, they replaced the Reichsmark with a military mark. Western allies tried to limit the issue of military marks to control inflation, but the Soviet sector was willing to print extra marks to pay for the rising cost of occupation. So it was the same process that Germany was facing after World War I of an inflationary death spiral. And the economy was collapsing by the spring of 1948. Food production was only half of what it was in 1938. Industrial production was a third of its pre-war level. Wages were low and many workers failed to show up because salaries were controlled by the government, which led to a decline in production. People devoted their time instead to finding the food they needed to survive. Maybe they would go foraging, 
Maybe they would barter with the goods they did have on the black market. As I said earlier, one of the most reliable units of currency were American cigarettes, kind of like in prison. Cigarettes held their value no matter what. And many soldiers sold their cigarettes on the black market to add to the small salary they were receiving. GIs were issued cigarettes all the time, so this was kind of like a stipend. On the weekends, Germans would leave the cities to go to the countryside to buy food directly from farmers because there was nothing on the shelves in the city stores. Others grew so-called victory gardens in their backyards to keep themselves from starving. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. So Germany faced many challenges after World War II, but an advantage that it had that it didn't have in World War I is that the Allies actively looked to help Germany rebuild its economy. And this was decided at the Potsdam Conference. This conference took place from July 17th to August 2nd, 1945, after Germany officially surrendered in World War II. The goal was to achieve sustained peace, but the main focus of the Potsdam Conference was defining and implementing a plan for Germany to promote its economic stability and make it able to repay war reparations without completely bankrupting it like it did in World War I. The four parts of the plan were decentralization, demilitarization, denazification, and democratization of Germany. Another goal was to completely transform the West German economy. The economy of Nazi Germany was based on heavy industry and heavy levels of production. But instead of eliminating industrial and economic capabilities like what happened after World War I and the demilitarization of Germany, the Potsdam Conference wanted to transform Germany and maintain some level of economic strength so it could recover. Germany would become a nation whose economy was based more on efficient agriculture and light domestic industry. Germany was occupied by four zones, and the English, French, and American occupied zones eventually became West Germany, and the Russian occupied zone became Eastern Germany. Originally, Allied powers administered German administrative and economic controls. They were directly involved in running Germany for the first few years, but that was mostly to make sure that Germany wouldn't develop wartime potential right away. But most of the control was later given to the German people so that they would sink or swim after World War II. The most strict restrictions were placed on Germany's wartime industries. The production of arms, ammunition, and implements of war, tanks, and aircraft were prohibited or prevented. And any types of metals or chemicals or machinery that were directly necessary for a war were also rigidly controlled. That was the big build-up to the main point of this episode, which is how did Germany recover? Let's get to it now that we've set the stage. Like I said at the beginning of this episode, Germany's factories and railroads and cities were completely in ruin after World War II. But the Allied occupational policymakers continued the Nazi government system of price controls that had been imposed before and during the war. Germany's Social Democratic Party wanted to continue controls and rationing, and some American advisors agreed, especially John Kenneth Galbraith. Galbraith was an official of the U.S. State Department. He oversaw economic policy for occupied Germany and Japan, and he'd been the price control czar of the U.S. from 1941 to 1943. In the Soviet zone, factories that weren't destroyed in the war were dismantled and shipped back to the Soviet Union. Sometimes they were used, sometimes they were mothballed and not used at all, but they weren't in Germany. Soviet soldiers, as they had done when they came into Germany in World War II, continued to terrorize the population. And a communist political structure was quickly set up by Stalin. In the Allied zones, American and British troops treated the occupied Germans much better, but the population was still sort of viewed as an enemy, and they weren't shown excessive sympathy or generosity, especially after news of the Holocaust came out. But there were a number of German intellectuals and academics who pushed back against the system of price control. One of the leading figures in this movement was Walter Eucken, who was a professor at the University of Freiburg. He was restricted in what he could say during the Nazi regime, but he and his colleagues had a network amongst themselves that shared ideas of establishing a market-oriented economy. And they had plans for doing this in a post-Hitler period that they all desperately wanted to happen. They followed classical free market economists like Ludwig von Mises and Wilhelm Rupke. And one of Eucken's protégés was an economist named Ludwig Erhard. Erhard was a veteran of World War I, and he earned his PhD in economics in 1925 from the University of Frankfurt. He refused to join the Nazi party, so this cut short his career. 
He abandoned academia and joined a business research institute in Nuremberg. He started to work for the American Occupation Forces as an economic advisor in 1945, and he served in several commissions until he was commissioned by Allied authorities to steer the West German economy. Erhard was influenced by a school of economics called ordo-liberalism. This has its roots in the University of Freiburg in the 1930s, and it's also closely linked to the classical liberal tradition. For two years, Erhard served as the economics minister in the American zone in Bavaria from 1946 to 1948, and he advocated market reforms. In radio broadcasts, he told his German audience that they had essentially brought their current situation on themselves, and they could only get out of it through saving, self-responsibility, hard work, and restore their prosperity. In 1948, the British and American zones were combined into one administrative unit, and Erhard was now the director of economics. In June of 1948, he instituted two pieces of reform that completely transformed the German economy. The first was to restore money stability, and his second policy sought to end inflation after effects from the Nazi period. The first policy was to introduce a new currency, and people could exchange 10 of the old marks for one of the new to reduce the money supply, keep inflation under control, and also give people hard currency. But the second one was much more radical. He wanted to completely abolish price and production controls. Without any approval from the Allied military command, one Sunday, when the authorities were out of their offices, Erhard announced on the radio that the very next morning, all price controls would be abolished. This was a very radical movement. He was undoing decades of established policy in Germany overnight. Allied leaders were shocked by this. They thought this was far too radical. It would lead to complete and total chaos. General Lucius Clay, who was commander of American forces in Germany, he called Erhard into his office and said, Herr Erhard, my advisors tell me you're making a terrible mistake. And Erhard replied, don't listen to them, General. My advisors tell me the same thing. So what he announced is that first, each German would be given 40 Deutschmarks that replaced the old currency of the Reichsmarks. This would be followed by a second installment of 20 Deutschmarks basically giving people money to buy things when they may have very well had no money or they were relying almost completely on bartering because the Reichsmarks were completely useless. All debts and credits would be converted into this new currency at the rate of 10 to 1, and people would have to prove how they came by sums that exceeded 5,000 Reichsmarks. So that way people weren't just gaming the system and taking too much of this new currency. Erhard knew that his plan wouldn't succeed if the new money were used by people, but then they went into empty stores and empty warehouses like the old currency had faced. That's why he announced the complete abolition of wage and price controls. No use in introducing a new currency if it can't be used on anything. The plan is that first, controls would end on an enormous range of consumer goods. Then, within six months, controls on food would be dropped. He promoted these measures by claiming that they were a patriotic move to replace a foreign economic system that had been imposed on Germany, even though that happened from within and not without. Erhard believed, as do most modern economists, that 2,000 years of data going back to Diocletian showed that wage controls and price controls didn't work. They always ended in a lack of goods, they destroyed incentives, and they transferred wealth from citizens into the hands of bureaucrats and those favored by the government. Well, the effects were dramatic. As I described at the top of this episode, it was as if stores came to life. Black markets disappeared. Buying and selling with Deutschmarks replaced barter. Almost overnight, factories began to belch smoke again, and observers said they could see delivery trucks crowding the streets and the noise of construction crews clattering throughout the cities again. The success of this was unmistakable. A few months later, the French zone followed suit, and industrial production skyrocketed. In the second half of 1948, industrial production increased nearly 50% from its June level. A year later, at the end of 1949, the production was 81% above what it had been when the reforms were first implemented. Prices did spike initially when sellers could sell things for what the market value made them actually worth instead of a price control. But by the end of 1950, there was greater industrial and agricultural output that was offered on a more open market which reduced the cost of living because they produced the goods that people wanted and at economies of scale, they were cheaper. 
After the French, British, and American zones merged in 1949, growth continued, and Earhart then became the 